Thanks for tuning in to Border City Rock Talk once again. Um, make sure you hit that subscribe button. I don't get paid for this yet, so just kidding. Anyways, I got Joel Hoekstra here with me. Joel, uh, you might know him. Uh, well, you will know him, obviously, touring with uh, Night Ranger. Cher's go-to guy when uh, she needs him uh, is her uh, guitar virtuoso. Uh, White Snake, uh, Hoekstra 13, Running Games is a kick-ass album he did during the pandemic. And we're talking to... Uh, Joel, right now about Trans Siberian Orchestra (TSO). How are you doing, Joel? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. Not a problem. So, I remember, I remember last time we spoke. Um, I'd heard of Trans Siberian Orchestra because they would do about four or five shows, um, not too far from me, about five hours down the I-75 in um, Auburn, Michigan. And I never really knew what the hell it was. I thought it was some kind of um play or uh kind of I, I i knew it wasn't an orchestra for sure because i'd seen in reviews in metal magazines but i never really dug it until i saw some youtube clips so for the uh couple of viewers that are living uh in snowbanks here in canada um tell us about uh trans-siberian Siberian orchestra how it started and and uh just give us a bit of a a fresher well our founder, Paul O'Neill, um, set out to basically form a, a progressive rock band um, that could tour around uh, these great albums that he was making that were holiday inspired, right? So right. Um, basically, it's really hard to describe TSO, but I'm going to do my best here, okay? It's like if you take the theatricality of Andrew Lloyd Webber matched up with a rock opera like uh, Tommy from The Who, uh, throw in a Pink Floyd laser light show, um, the pyrotechnics and moving hydraulics of like a KISS show. Uh, you got some classical, the, obviously the classical music element in there, but all kind of presented in a rock fashion. Mm -hmm. So you take all that and mix it together and you kind of get what TSO is, but it really is a unique experience in a show. Um, and I think that's the reason we've been around as long as we have and we've had the success that we've had. I mean, it was like, you know, Paul O'Neill was just the, the mad scientist who cooked this up and I think everybody went, huh? And, but it just it exploded. And um, so we, we have a tremendous fan base, people that come back year after year. It appeals to all ages. Um, I, it sounds like cliche, you know, when you say there's something in it for everybody, you know, but uh, it's totally true. There's uh, we, we look out when we're playing and we see all the way from kids to um, the grandparents and the, yeah. and the parents. They're all there together, families three generations deep, and they all look happy, which is kind of like amazing. You know, it doesn't look like the kids are being held hostage there or uh, the kids drag the parents there or anything like that. So it's it's really unique. If you haven't seen it, I'd say come on out and give us a shot this year. So um, in regards to the music, um, I'd say most of it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, most of it are, you know, kind of Christmas songs that we grew up listening to. Is there anything unique in there that you've put together? Oh, no, definitely. I, I think the majority of the music is um, written uh, along the lines of telling the, the three stories. So there were three Christmas albums, right? And they mm. each tell a story, basically. And so the front half of the show is presented as such. You get one of those rock operas in the front half. And this year, it's Christmas Eve and Other Stories, which is really the um, the one that has seen the most success touring-wise. It's the one that seems to appeal to the fans the most. Um, and then the back half is a little bit more of a free-for-all, uh, focusing on the production elements. And uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but in terms of the music, it's, I would say it's more like original music with citations of things that people would be familiar with, the Christmas okay, yeah. songs and the classical pieces and things like that, yeah. Um, I know that the uh, production and for people just, um, just here's another little, you know, aha moment for people to, that are thinking about going to the show. Um, the, the production is about $20 million just to put it on, correct? It's, it's way yeah, up. Yeah, I, I mean, Paul was... He always believed on starting on 10. Yeah. <laughs> so I think where the, where the TSO production begins is where most acts leave off. And then kind of find a way to um, up the game every year. 
um, make it bigger and better has always been the philosophy on the uh, the production with the show. So that really is uh, a huge amount of the appeal. I don't want to undersell the uh, the music end of things because obviously oh, no. I'm a musician in it, but there are people that go to this just to absorb the production elements because it's it's staggering. You know, you got a video wall behind yeah. us that's just massive, and uh, the stage is the width of the arena. I was just going to ask about that. Yeah, it's just it's it definitely much larger. I mean, it's it's more on the like um, uh, on the scale of something like the Wall or something like that. You know, if you wow. go to see that tour, it's just, yeah. it's just massive. Um, why didn't Paul just make ten one louder? <laughs> well, uh, tap fans will get that one, eh, Joel? I the, all the time. Look, trust me, I'm a huge Tap fan. I love that stuff. The Christopher Guest films. I'm a big fan of all of those. Waiting for Guffman and uh, Best in Show and A Mighty Wind. Love all those films. They crack me up. <laughs> um, so who who's in the um, the cast this year? Some um, names that uh, the viewers will know. I know. Um, um, I interviewed uh, not too long ago Jeff Scott Soto. He's back. I think this is his 14th year. Um, and go and watch that video, guys. Uh, it's it's really kick-ass. So um, who else are the, um, you know, some names that um, are mainstream, per se? Uh, well, I mean, you got the Sabotage guys, Al Petrelli and Chris Caffrey and, and Johnny Lee Middleton. So, uh, you know, those guys uh, definitely – are the the core of this thing i mean it's really um a lot of where this began was paul's involvement with sabotage and mm -hmm. um just sort of branched off into this um and then in the from the classic rock world you mentioned jess got so i'd say blas elias uh, uh playing drums um uh in the west band you got dino jalusic um singing out there uh who am I forgetting? Russell Allen in our band yeah. out east. These are like I'm just speaking in terms of like yeah. the classic rock people, maybe that mm -hmm. uh, people would um, would know. And of course, I, f I failed to mention Jeff Plate with the Sabotage guys. So Jeff out east, um, uh, they, they we're all guys that are known throughout the the rock scene. Yeah, and everybody in the cast is is dynamic and everything. So how many people are um, travel with this uh, with this production? I think I want to say in the band on each side, you've got 19 people because there's a lot of singers. So it's, it sounds like, you know, what, what, you know, but it's like it's a it's a core band of, I think, six, six seven people. Because uh, we have two, key, two, two keyboards, a string master. Um, and then what we do is we pick up a little string section locally as we go as well. So there is a there is an orchestra per se. There's a string section up there with us um, to uh, widen the sound, just makes it that much more unique and huge um but a lot of it is the singers so i'd say in total you're talking i think 19 on each side tso west and tso east and then you've got um a massive crew i don't even that's, know that's what i was that's what i was getting at joel <laughs> with this production so yeah with your crew and your um you know your your, your drivers and your techs and everything how many are, are, are touring on this uh you know i i think i want to say when i went in to do press at the office that somebody had said something like around 120 on yeah. each side that, or something like that that's so I, the, it's it's really unbelievable the um how precise the crew is i mean to we, a lot of people don't realize that we're doing two shows a day in most of these cities so you're finishing up a show say at 10 30 at night in one city they're breaking down the show packing it up and had driving to the next city and having it up for say a 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. matinee. It's unbelievable yeah. that they're able to do it. Um, so it's, it really just comes down to everybody knowing exactly what role to play. And um, it's very unique in that uh, the crew is, feels like every bit the star of the show as say the people uh, playing the music in the band or whatever, because this thing wouldn't, it wouldn't function if, Right. You know, somebody didn't know what to do. It, it would throw the yeah. whole thing off. So it's it's really um, it, it's cool to be a part of. Just to be, you know, it's not. Um, it, we all we all kind of set aside our personal stuff for like the betterment of like the show. It's all about the show with TSO. Yeah. Like we want like the experience to be uh, what people feel like. Wow, like that was cool. Let's go back next year and make that a tradition. And that's you know, that was always Paul's vision for this thing to live on as a as a holiday tradition. And uh, so far, so good. I mean, it's it's amazing. We're packing arenas twice a day on, on a lot of these, and I just how unique that is in the rock world at all is um, it 
I mean, it basically doesn't exist. So to be able to get out there and play uh, for 10,000 people, a couple, two shows a day or something like yeah. that, 15,000 people, it's it's really, we get on the bus and just talk back and forth. Like, can you, can you believe it sometimes? I mean, we, they, you know, we, we still sit there and go like, I can't believe that we actually get to do this. That's amazing. Um, how many shows are in this tour? I know there's quite a bit. You start what, November, middle of November? Yeah, uh, yeah. We I think it kicks off November seventeen. I want to say is the yeah. initial date. So I think each band plays roughly fifty shows. So it's roughly a hundred. I'm not the guy that knows the exact wow. numbers. There are probably some that are like Joel. It's fifty two on the east, and you know I I don't know. But roughly a hundred shows total. Um, so yeah, we usually uh, we usually end up reaching about a million people on this. Yeah, I see some Canadian dates on there. That's going to be great to see you guys. Uh, is, is there no, Canadian? No, I'm, I, I'm, yeah, okay. You're messing I'm, with me. I'm messing I, with I, because um, you guys are playing Ontario, California. Not gotcha. The province. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, I, you know, typically we do play a Toronto show in Ottawa, and I know Montreal has been a stop in the past for the East Band. Uh, a couple other places, too, I'm trying to think. But they're just, I think Cooper. that... I think just with uh, all the complications of doing a border crossing, the yeah. uh, way things are right now, I'm going to guess. I, and I'm, that's total speculation. I don't know. Yeah, no, for sure. You know, sometimes this stuff comes down to venue availability, too. So, like, if you're routing and you're up north and then say you want to play Air Canada, or is that still the venue in Toronto? Is it still Air Canada? I don't know. What so, is it today? Maybe it has know. a new name now. Should be. I don't know. I, I, Hard to keep up with the corporate sponsor. It's actually uh, the Rogers Center. I don't know. They do. Oh, the Rogers it. Center. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, that would that would make sense. But um, anyway, sometimes if the venue's not available, so it's funny. Fans always take it personally. You know, in each no, city. We hey, man, we're not playing our city, man. It's like <laughs> I don't know. Number one, I just play the songs. So. In regards to um, you know your your um, your leadership role um, you know with White Snake, um, just a curious question: um, Does David and the management uh, realize that you're doing this every year, and you know they kind of try to work around the schedule that way so they don't have to fill you in? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a perfect explanation. Yeah, um, they're they're sensitive to it and have helped me out. So um, it's something when I joined White Snake that I've said, hey. You know, I've, I've got this gig every November, December, and uh, I, I rely upon it. You know, it's something that I do. How many uh, years you're, are you You're frozen on my end. Have we lost connection? Um, just for a second. Can you hear me? Have me. I do not have you. There we go. Yeah, we're good. You know what? Freeze frame. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course, man. So you can hear me and everything? I got you now. You were frozen for about, I'd say, 15, 20 seconds or something. So okay. well, I'm not sure if that answer came across all the way there, but yeah. <laughs> people are sick of hearing me talk already. They're like, stop. No, no. no so what, what was I saying? Um, we're talking about White Snake and your touring. Asking if uh, they kind of work around it yeah. a bit. And the answer is, yeah, they're, they're sensitive to it. It's something when I joined the band, I, I said, you know, I have this. And unbelievably, the first year we had this awesome co-headlining tour with Def Leppard, and it got backed up into TSO time. And I was like, geez, I just joined the band. This is putting me in a horrible situation. Um, but, you know, uh, thankfully, Paul O'Neill was um, generous and, and gave me a, a – a year off basically and oh. allowed me to come back to the group which i'm still you know very grateful for and um so here i am man all these years later so i joined in 2010 and now okay. we're 2021 it's kind of kind of amazing to uh be a feel like a veteran in the group at this point right right so um you released hoaxster 13 um running games this past um it was last year correct yeah, uh, February. So uh, how was that? Yeah. I know I love the album, and uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, it's so hard to say nowadays with everything being streaming and digital, and it's so not, you know. I, I'm have I make those really for like an artistic expression, you know, just something that's like I want to be part of my career. It gives me an outlet to make an album that I kind of get to do all the writing, write the the lyrics and the vocal melodies. That that's fun for me, just to have that opportunity and. Bands, as you know, are um, 
a little bit more of a democratic process. And so, you know, it's it's fun to make something occasionally where it's like, hey, this sounds like a band, but I'm I'm getting the ultimate say so and stuff. Um, with White Snake, uh, I know you guys are going on tour. Is it? It's twenty twenty two, correct? You guys start up. Uh, yeah, know? we start up in spring of twenty two. As of now, I do. There's, I think, there's more dates to be announced yet. I, in fact, I know there's more dates to be announced yet. But uh, what's been announced so far is a, uh, a run with Foreigner in the UK. Oh, um, nice. Start things off, and then and Europe on that as well. The band Europe, and then oh, we wow. have a European run with Europe with without Foreigner. So that's cool. Touring Europe with Europe. With Joey Tempest, yes, I remember seeing uh, Europe open up for Leopard, and the and the, the, I think I was too tanked because I was eighteen and we were young, but I was in like bleacher spots about you know a mile away from the stadium. But Joey's teeth were so friggin' white when he smiled, I could see him in the back row, right? Oh, great man. band! They sound they sound really they sound yeah. really great. We've we've played a lot of shows with those guys. They they're a great live band. They sound really good. They are. Um, is there anything in the works? Um, are you guys doing any writing right now for White Snake for an album or anything? I know uh, David released the Blues album and you participated on that. Yeah, so what happened there is that a lot of that was the stuff that's coming out on the Restless Heart um, re-release right now, that right. box set that's coming out. So that's something that is that I was a part of recording-wise. So he had an album out years ago uh, called Restless Heart that he was intending to be a solo album, kind of on the heels of the Coverdale Page stuff. Yeah. And so uh, when he recorded it and Adrian did the guitars, they did a little bit more of like the single guitar pass kind of thing. And David really loves the, um, uh, now I'm trying to think of what he calls it, uh, uh, the, the Panzer Division, the, like a squadron. He wants the White Snake albums to be massive productions. So yeah. uh, for the re-release of this, yeah, what happened is the label said, no, we really want you to release this under the name White Snake. And I think it, for him, he was always always felt like he wished it had a Les Paul on it too. Mm. So I got this strange task of basically doubling Adrian Vandenberg's rhythms with a Les Paul, like it's super tight, like to the point where it's like he can't necessarily even tell there's another guitar playing, but okay. kind of patterns it up. And then if I heard an overdub here or there, um, he wanted me to throw that stuff on there too. And then he had Derek Sherini and Ed Keys. Yep. So it's just kind of like this souped up version of uh, Restless Heart, which was released years ago, but um, it definitely has a bigger sound to it. Um, so that that's coming out right now. But in terms of like brand new stuff, like um, uh, no, there's nothing in the works right now. Okay, um, gonna ask you a couple quirky questions, and then I'll let you go to your next interview. Um, fans might want to know what did uh, Joel Holtz do last night? Uh, well, big surprise. I I played guitar. I'm I'm <laughs> I, I've been teaching a lot during COVID, so that's um that's been a big thing as far as me spending time with my guitar. So I taught six lessons yesterday so there's six hours with my guitar and then i prepped for tso i'd say about three or four hours so i, I played about nine or ten hours yesterday total between it all have you um when i did watch a baseball game i practiced though i prepped during that giants dodgers game last night so i okay. i'm, a, I'm a, sport, a sports thing kind of zens me out a little bit if i have it on the tv i can kind of prep and if i need yeah. a five minute breather mentally. It's almost, I feel like I'm almost more productive when I do that, stay with it longer. Right. Um, when are you guys gonna do pre-rehearsals for the show? Um, so I travel to rehearsals November three. Um, everybody's a little bit staggered as far as when they show up. So um, it's different timing for the singers and, and for the West band and the West singers. And so it's, uh, so uh, slightly different for everybody, but I'm November three. Cool. Um, favorite Canadian guitarist? Uh, I mean, you know, I, I'm going to go Rick Emmett, man. I love Alex. Oh, wow. I love some Alex Lifeson, but I'm going to go Rick Emmett because you know, I, you know, I was like, I was a Triumph guy, and you know, uh, just Rick is like, you know, I got to jam with him and on the Peter at gigs, and um, so uh, you know, I just did the the. Uh, collab video for Ken Tamplin Vocal Academy do a cover and lay it on the line, right? So, nice, yeah. And I was, I was really gassed. The Triumph guys um, really liked it, I guess, and shared it, and that was super cool for me. And so Rick has always just been a really nice guy to me over the years. Yeah. Um, uh, I just, 
you know, uh, somehow I when I, I know when I first met him, I was doing some gigs with Big Brother and the Holding Company, and I think we were on the same bill, and maybe he was playing a Rick Emmett solo show with a band at the time, and I got to meet him, and I definitely fanned out too much on him, and I was like, dude, I love you, man, you know, and then uh, I think uh, as the years went by, I got to work with him on the Peter Rick gigs a little bit, and actually play his songs with him, and he thought, okay, this guy's safe, he's not asking for my autograph or pictures with me he's cool you know and uh and now years later i think he's he's really learned to trust me because he's seen me playing in bands he's like all right this guy can't be too dangerous to society or me uh but uh no he's great i love i, I love so much of the, the triumph stuff they were a very underrated band yes um because you know people like to sum up that 80s thing with the hair band thing with the la thing you know but there right. was also yeah. great bands like triumph that were happening that were like you know so talented yeah. and on on every count great great on their instruments great songwriting great singing um yeah, so great great stage show too one of the yeah best. yeah great great stage show rick's a, was a great entertainer i am sure he still is um yeah. but yeah i've 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 been offered a couple times to get up and sit in on his acoustic shows, and it has never quite worked out. When he's in New York, I've always been on tour. Right. Um, so hopefully someday the stars will align, and I'll be able to get up and, and uh, jam on one of his acoustic shows. I'd love that. Well, I think uh, the stars will be aligning because I just talked to him yesterday, and I, we mentioned TSO, and he mentioned you and how fond he was of your playing, to be honest with you. That, well, that's, that's amazing. You know, Like I said, he's always been really good to me. Um, unnecessarily so he's rick emmett <laughs> i'm some guy with a name you can't pronounce that's it has a few I, gigs you know? am i getting it right it's okay no you're doing it you're doing it great but i i'm just saying you know by yeah in terms of where my standing in the rock world you know so uh yeah i mean i think that that's uh that's awesome of him to do that uh one one more quick question um i think maybe one i might do two um is if Cher is going out on tour, does um do you, does Joel still get a call? Probably not. I the way things were shaken out at the beginning of 2020, I uh, the way I mean it's funny how life took a turn on all of us with this, the COVID thing. But I mean, I had six months lined up with White Snake and two months of TSO, and right. uh, so when they had the dates, then she was doing a lot. They were like you know, what's, what, what works, what doesn't. And I, I was available for about 20% of her shows. And yeah. I mean, I just, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't really, uh, the, the way that came into play was David was taken off 2017 to have knee surgery. And I just kind of reached out to people and said, if anybody needs a fill in, I'm your guy. I don't really need a new band because we'll yeah. be out in 2018 and um and then even when david did go out in 2018 we just really did a couple months just to see you know get his legs underneath him literally and figuratively um uh, and so it really was a great fit for a couple of years and then 2019 was really rough because white snake heated up a lot and of course i had tso and so i only made half of her shows in 2019 that was like a very long explanation of it all but um you, but yeah, that, that's too. So yeah, I mean, it's the, there's only so long, you know. Juggling two things is hard, and yeah. then juggling three things, um, unless you're Mike Portnoy, and somehow you can kind of say, <laughs> you know, you're you're in charge of the touring thing. So Mike, I you know, I always applaud Mike on that. I'm like, dude, not only are you in all these bands, but you're able to like you know line all the tours up back to back. And yeah, uh, gosh, I mean, that would be amazing to be able to do that. Cool. Um, Last thing, uh, anything to say to your Canadian fans out there? Hope to get up your way soon, man. Hopefully the farewell tour with White Snake does some Canadian dates. It'd be great to get up there. Um, you know, I'm from the Midwest, so we, we, uh, we, we are basically Canadians who dip down into the U.S. I, I grew up in the Chicago area. I always say right. we're... I always feel like I fit in with Canadians when I go up there. Like I feel like, yeah, you're you're my people. We're more of the same. Uh, the Midwest U.S. people are a lot like the Canadians, I think. Perfect. Well, I'd like to thank you, man. Everybody, hit that subscribe button and uh, God bless uh, Joel. And uh, we'll see you soon. Cool. Thanks so much, brother. Appreciate the time. All right. Cheers. Have a good one.